whenever you're ready. Can you hear me? Turn it. Turn on your Mac. Now? Now it's really on. Thank you. I want to thank you very much to the League of Women Voters for having this forum. I want to thank the audience for being such a, uh, having so many people come out tonight interested in this important race. Very pleased to see so many of you tonight. Um, and to those folks who couldn't come tonight because of, of it's Rosh Hashanah, I apologize for that. Uh, and thank you all for being here. I'm also very pleased that my opponent is here tonight. Um, he chose not to come to seven of the eight forums that happened during the primary. And uh, we tweaked him about that a little bit in the press. We felt we had to do that. And so I'm really excited that he's out here tonight, as I do believe it is uh, the job of our candidates and our representatives to answer the questions that we all have for them. I'm running for this seat in Congressional District 1 because I am deeply disappointed in the way Congress is functioning today. We have a system that is one of the best in the world, and it is troubled. And while we have what I believe is a moderate majority in Congress, in the House of Representatives particularly, uh, willing to do some work, we do have a group of extremists who are obstructing legislation in this Congress, and I want to get in there and get some work done. I am uh, the daughter of school teachers. I uh, came up through the public school system, and my children came up through the public school system as well, and I'm a strong advocate of public education and investing in that in this country. I'm also the mother and the daughter of veterans. My uh, son, who's a veteran, is struggling to make it in this economy, and I am a strong advocate of veterans' issues in this country. We should, when our children decide to put their life on the line for this country, we need to be there for them for every reason for the rest of their lives. I have a bachelor's and a master's in international relations and a uh, second master's in public policy. And I will bring that excellent education to Congress to make the tough decisions we have to make. I was fortunate enough to get that education thanks to federal loans, and uh, I was able to pay all of that back. And that's uh, actually the only federal assistance I've ever had, and I did pay that back. But I believe we should be helping students to uh, get a good education as well. Thank you very much. If we could please hold our applause until both candidates are done with the forum tonight, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate being able to be here tonight. Uh, thank you to the League for faithfully putting on these forums over the years. I've enjoyed participating in them in the past, and I'm glad to be here tonight with you as uh, Congress is in recess until after the election, unless something pipes up that we really have to address. So, you know me, I'm from the neighborhood. Um, our family's been here in Butte County for many, many years, and I really have been honored and enjoyed representing the North State, my capacities over, over the years. And so, it's first term in the U.S. House of Representatives. It's been an amazing experience for me, for my family, but also I think we're on the path to uh, a better way for America here. Uh, we're, we've been pretty productive this last year and a half in the sense that we need to go in the direction of jobs, strengthening our economy, and putting America back on top first because America is a shining light to all the world of what we can do when we have the freedom, we have the opportunity to shine as individuals. And so that's what I'm trying to instill in Congress. It's been uh, a tough row. We have a uh, strong disagreements on issues, but we have a lot of times we work together on a bipartisan and a bicameral basis in the House, too. That doesn't always get noticed uh, by the folks or doesn't always come out in the media. We can get things done when we work together and we have common goals. And so for the North State, it's getting our economy going again. It's getting people back to have an opportunity for paying jobs that come from the private sector especially. Now, we're seeing California in the middle of drought. We're seeing our forests go up in smoke. I sit on the Natural Resources Committee to try and do something about that. And we're going to have success if we pull together and use the types of facts, the types of science, the types of common sense that's going to make those things work better for the people in our state, for the West, for all of our country. So I'm eager to get started once again. And uh, I appreciate, again, you all taking your time to be part of the civic process and being here tonight. So with that, thank you. I look forward to your questions tonight. Thank you. 
And we will start the questions off uh, with Mr. Gascoigne from the Chico News and Review. Uh, directed at Ms. Hall. Okay. Um, this was just touched on by uh, Mr. Lamalfa, but uh, is there such a thing as human-caused climate change? And if so, should it be a concern when considering certain legislation? And I'm first to answer. Uh, yes, 97% of the scientists uh, who are uh, experts in this agree that climate change is real and it is human caused. Not only that, the insurance and reinsurance industry is preparing for the effects of climate change. The US uh, Catholic bishops have agreed that it's an issue that needs to be uh, taken up. Homeland Security and the DND, DOD are all preparing for what will happen and we need to deal with this today. It is one of the biggest issues uh, in this world today and we can take action on it if we can only move forward from debating the facts and actually start debating the solutions. Well, the, the climate of the globe has been changing since God created it. It goes up and down with temperature, with uh, different conditions. Thank you. And so what is mankind's role in that? Well, I'll tell you, America is always on the leading edge of the technology to do things better. We have, we're running the cleanest cars, the cleanest trucks that we ever have. We're finding new ways to do energy more efficiently, more uh, cheaply, which makes America first in the global economy. If we make America stronger in the global economy, do we want instead to have the jobs here, to have things happen in this country, or do we want to export them to countries that do things dirtier than we do? So allowing the technology to develop, we can do better environmentally all the time if we're thriving, if we're doing well. And so that's why I battle in Washington to make sure energy is being done and explored for and found in this country so that we're not getting it from our enemies or that the other countries are doing all the production in a dirty fashion and our jobs are exported. Thank you. Uh, next question will come from Mr. Elworth. And Mr. Lamalfa will be the first to answer. This is sort of a follow-up question in a way. Um, one of the issues that's been important in Butte County is the question of hydraulic fracking, fracturing. Where do you two come down on that issue? Uh, are you speaking, sir, of the measures on the ballot or in general in hydraulic fracturing? Okay, thank you. Uh, hydraulic fracturing has been extremely successful. It's really been uh, a miracle, in a sense, of producing energy, making it available for America as well as other countries that are embracing it. And so the technology improves on, all the time on that as well. But it's made natural gas so available in this country that it's, it hasn't been this cheap in a long time. It's also attracting people from Europe that want to invest in America, they're considering doing that with manufacturing, with jobs here, because the cost of energy are coming down, at least in that vein. Now we still have to do more about gasoline prices and diesel, that's a different topic. But hydraulic fracturing, done properly, has really been an amazing achievement for stable energy that comes from the U.S. at stable prices. So I support it, and I also support that we have strong protocols to make sure it's being done right. For those of, the, those of you who don't know, hydraulic fracturing or fracking is uh, the, the practice of injecting hundreds of thousands of gallons of water deep into the earth to crack the shale and get the remnant oil out of, from underground. Uh, we use water that we don't have to spare right now to do that. It involves multitudes of chemicals uh, that are injected in the ground and are seeping into the aquifers. Um, and it is, at, as far as we can tell right now, causing earthquakes, causing home prices to drop uh, where fracking is happening near homes. It's a dangerous practice that is not regulated currently. There is a giant loophole for the Clean Water Act altogether, which is unheard of for any other industry. I am not opposed to responsible, careful ways to bring oil out of the earth. But fracking is not it. I currently support a moratorium until we can do more studies and make sure that if we're going to do it at all, it's going to be done properly. 
please respect the rules that we have established so that we can have a fair discussion of the issues. Thank you. This question comes from the audience. Would you agree to raise the cap on payroll tax as part of a fix for Social Security? Uh, or are you in form of any form of privatizing Social Security? And this question would be answered first by Ms. Hall. Thank you for that question. I'm an advocate for protecting our Social Security payments. That is an earned benefit that people have paid into for much of their lives, at least people who earn less than $150,000 a year. And we need to strengthen and secure it. Uh, privatizing Social Security would put us in the same position that uh, people whose retirement funds were invested in oh, on Wall Street recently have been put in, where they ended up losing much of their life savings. Social Security works well right now. It needs to be strengthened, and I don't support privatizing it. I am open to efficiencies. There are efficiencies we can make in the federal government, absolutely. And having worked in the federal government, I'm going to be the first one to point out where those things can happen. I am also open to raising the, cap, the payroll uh, cap in order to make sure that we secure our Social Security. Thank you, Mr. LaMalfa. Yes. Um, <laughs> would you agree to raise the cap on the payroll tax as part of a fix for Social Security? And do you uh, agree with privatizing any portion of Social Security? I don't think we need to do either one of those measures until we've assessed and actually acted on making Social Security more sustainable as is. We have uh, the need to uh, make people that have paid into it be the ones that are the beneficiaries of that more so. And I think that uh, when we look at Social Security perhaps not being solvent after the year 2035 or 2040, we have some serious efforts we need to make on that. Now, what that's going to require is that if anybody wants to take on the issue of Social Security, I was speaking with a colleague about this just recently, that we have to do it in an honest, open forum with a constructive uh, input on both sides on this because it becomes a hot button issue, it becomes a third rail issue, so to speak. Nobody wants to touch it because it becomes so political. But if we want people to be able to receive what they've been, uh, what they've paid into that over time and have, first of all, have the government not be borrowing from it, but have it a big, big pot of IOUs, it belongs to the people, and it needs to be sustained long-term and find a way to do so. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is, what will you do to address the severe drought that we are in? And this uh, question goes to Mr. LaMalfa first. Thank you. It's been an issue on my plate for a long time as a, as a legislator, and I'm, I'm hoping we can have more success. It's sad that it takes a drought to get this on the front page for folks to uh, really want to weigh in. Government needs to move on this. And so I have legislation currently in Washington, H.R. 4300, to address, to finish talking about, finish studying, and authorize Sites Reservoir over here on the west side of the valley. That would mean up to 1.9 million acre feet. Doesn't solve all of California's problems, but it gets a start on that. It's going back in the direction when, when there was a time in the state where we built the water storage systems that we're enjoying now with Lake Shasta, Lake Oroville, and many others in the Central Valley Project, as well as the State Water Project. So we know how to do it. We know it needs to be done. Sites Reservoir, I think, is the one that's at the top of the list because I was out there two different times, at least, with biologists to say, if we can't build it here environmentally, then we can't build one anywhere. In California, the United States is a can-do state and a can-do country. We can do this. Let's get it done. What most people might uh, in the state of California don't realize is that 60% of their water comes from the North State, and only 1%, and in the current water bond that's being proposed, it would be much less than 1% of the funds to help sustain our watersheds come back to this district. That's unconscionable, and that's a fac factor of the lack of leadership we've had in keeping our water up here in the North State where it belongs first before we share it with the rest of the state. Now, Regional and small-scale dams are a partial solution to our drought, but they are not the solution. As my friend likes to say, pouring cement does not make it rain. And if you look around, you can see that we have some very nice dams right now that are empty. The issue is allocation of water. Again, we need to make sure we take care of our farmers and our ranchers, our businesses and our homes, and, and be part of that conversation that is not happening right now that says that our North State needs to have a higher priority in water. Thank you. Mr. Gascoigne? To Ms. Hall. 
Yes. Um, <clears throat> getting away from uh, the domestic scene a bit, how is the U.S., how, how do you think the U.S. is reacting to what is going on with ISIS in Iraq and Syria? Thank you for that question. That's a very important issue at the top of the list right now. I'm most concerned that Congress has been uh, given a seven-week full paid vacation to go home rather than staying in Washington and debating the issue of whether or not we should be involved in this upcoming war in the Middle East. I support right now the airstrikes that are happening, the ISIL and ICE or ISIS is a clear terrorist threat, not just to the Middle East, but also to this country. And we need to be involved in a small way in helping stop that. We cannot be as the policemen of the world. And this area is a region that needs to have a regional political solution. I'm pleased right now that Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and the United Arab Emirates are involved as well, equally with the United States. They soon need to be taking over the leadership to deal with this uh, horrific issue that's happening overseas. Again, I call on the President and Congress to call Congress back to Washington and debate this issue. If we're going to be asking our children to ultimately end up supporting war in that area of the world, we need to make sure there's a thorough debate about that. Uh, please restate, Mr. Gascoigne. Oh, um, how, <clears throat> how do you judge or rate the way the U.S. government is reacting to what is going on with ISIS in Iraq and Syria? The U.S. government has, uh, our, our military, our, uh, all different branches have uh, engaged in that we need to, first of all, destroy ISIL because the horrendous things they're doing to innocent people over there and the threat that it poses to our allies, such as Israel, even Western Europe, and our own porous border we have here is not to be taken lightly. So anything less than a serious approach is dereliction of duty. Congress acted, along with the President, before our adjournment to address the need for airstrikes, but also a solution with the partners in the Mideast. And those partnerships are tenuous sometimes, but this is the coalition that we have to put together. So what we have is a product here where the executive branch will be working to develop those relationships to have a strong uni unified force with people in the Arab world as well as the United States help. So our, our Air Force will be part of that. Uh, the Arab world will be putting forth their troops for training as well as funding to fund the effort there. So I think with what we put thank together. You, thank you, Mr. LaMalfa. Thank you very much. Mr. Elworth? I found the button. Um, one of the things that is a big issue, again, in Butte County uh, has been uh, access to and availability to go into and use the national forest lands, both for recreational purposes and for logging and for other activities within the forests. What should, what should the stance be on the federal level about citizen access to these forests? To Mr. Hall, yes. Or, I mean, <laughs> Mr. Thank Homolfa. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we should all be together on petitioning and being very loud about getting the Forest Service to do much more management. It's not really managing our federal lands. These are our lands right now. And that would mean that when we have an inventory of trees per acre that makes the forest a tinderbox instead of a managed forest, like you see on a lot of times on private lands or state lands or others that are being managed properly. We just toured uh, Siskiyou County Monday all day long looking at the damage to the city of Weed as well as the 250,000 acres that have been lost around the county. And most of that has been in action by the Forest Service. We have roadless areas, we have people being cut off from recreation and access. That recipe is not working. I actually asked the Forest Service personnel there, what will this land look like in say five to seven years from now compared to the private property next door? That private property will be soon thriving again because they're gonna be taking out the salvage timber, replanting, they admitted to me the Forest Service land will have a bunch of gray dead trees and brush growing in it, which is the next tinderbox. Thank you. Ms. Hall? Yes. Thank you. 
Uh, I've been advocating for the need for fire safe clearing in federal forests this entire time I've been out campaigning for a year and a half and warning about the pro possibility of another rim fire, which we are now seeing up north. Again, there's been 30 years of mismanagement of the federal and state forest land. Uh, and there's been all that time of opportunity to, t to take this on and handle it before we had the next wildfire. And that hasn't been done. Just last week, my colleague, Congressman Garamendi proposed that we fully fund the firefighting efforts as well as the prevention efforts. And my first question was, why hasn't this been done before? Again, there's been a complete lack of leadership when it comes to the North State issues, especially our forests. They do need fire safe clearing. We can create a private part private-public partnership, create jobs, get people in there, clear out the urban-rural interface. Uh, we could we could deal with multiple issues at once if we took that on, and that will be one of my highest priorities in Congress. Thank you. This question goes to Ms. Hall. What is your position on immigration reform? This is one of those areas where the moderate uh, middle of this country and Congress has come to agreement in principle. Our immigration system is broken. It's clear that that's the case. We're seeing uh, continuous problems at the border. We're not handling our uh, immigrants who are in this country now. The first thing that needs to happen is immigration reform, whereby we make it possible for immigrants who come here to get through the process in something less than 10 years and become citizens. We're also, we've spent, we've doubled the amount of money going to the border and that's not working either. We need to do uh, more to handle and process the people coming across the border. We're going to need to have employ employment, employer checks. I would support a guest worker program. We need to make sure the DREAM Act kids are handled and treated uh, fairly and with compassion. Um, and uh, ultimately, we need Congress to pass a bill that's functional. Thank you. One more time. Pardon? One more time. Oh. You keep, you keep snatching the question. What is your position on immigration reform? Thank you. Stealing the question. Immigration reform looks to me like enforcing the laws we already have in place. We have laws on illegal immigration already. That's why it's called illegal. If we enforced the border in a manner prescribed by already existing laws, we would be much better off. We can accommodate citizens, people seeking citizenship, much better than what we're doing now. We should have it be an incentive to follow the law instead of 10 or 15 years sometimes for people to apply for citizenship. That's where government's falling down, is that we're not making it user-friendly for citizenship. And we're also not addressing people that are overstaying their visas. That's 40% of the illegal immigration problem in this country. So. If uh, the executive branch would enforce the laws we have, we wouldn't be having to talk about reforming things. We'd have just very narrow areas we'd be looking at. So let's have a guest worker program with people that are documented. They would have free flow back and forth across the border to go see their families, to come work here. And it would work much better if we would just address that and enforce the laws we have. Thank you. What is your position on the Affordable Care Act? And that question goes to Mr. LaMalfa. Thank you. Well, the Affordable Care Act, I think, had probably lofty and good goals. It's like be sure that everybody's covered, cut costs, address the needs that we're lacking in health care in this country right now. Unfortunately, the approach in action has started out of the starting blocks. Was it websites didn't work? Government trying to manage people's health care insurance and finding brokers for it. We have a broker system already where people can seek health insurance. So the sad thing about it is that many people that were already happy and satisfied with their coverage have lost that. People that thought they were going to get a break on that, perhaps from the ACA, like $2,500 less per year as advertised, have seen their costs skyrocket. So the government management of this program has not worked. We need to do refinement and uh, improvements to what's happening in the private sector, but what we have now has been a disaster. So let's go back to something that we're offering, such as American Health Care Reform Act. Keep your plan, keep your doctor, and we'll address the people that need help, because we're not the type of country to let people go without, but we need to do it efficiently, because Thank you. It's, it is a taxpayer's money. 
The Affordable Care Act was a compromise between the Democrats and the Republicans to help bring the cost of uh, health care down and to help so many of our unemployed people get insurance. It has succeeded wildly in some ways, so in particular making sure that people with pre-existing conditions would not be turned down from health care, reducing the cost of health care to women who are 50 percent of the population, uh, and bringing uh, millions more into the health care system who were not uh, covered before. And by the way, even when they didn't have health care, we were paying the cost of them ending up in emergency rooms. It does have problems. It has some serious problems that need to be fixed, including the med medical device tax and those people who have fallen between the cracks and whose uh, health care costs are rising. They need to be dealt with. Let me remind you that my opponent put his first priority is repealing the Affordable Care Act and that Congress has had 52 votes to undo the entire thing. If they had had 52 votes to improve or implement the act, it would be working fine by now. Thank you. This next question uh, will come from Mr. Gascoigne to Ms. Hall. Uh, the Farm Bill that was passed earlier this year had some critics who said it, that it expands crop insurance for farmers by $7 billion over the next decade, creates new subsidies uh, that would kick in when prices drop, but at the same time, about 1.7 million people across 15 states will lose an average of $90 per month because of cuts in the food stamp program, which was tied to it. Is this fair? No, it's not. And I would call for an audit of the Farm Bill, which, by the way, has never been audited before, although the food stamp program has been audited. It's un unconscionable to me, as a fiscal moderate, that we're spending $14 billion a year to prop up millionaire farmers and telling people on food stamps that we can no longer to give them $4 a day to help them feed themselves, particularly women and children who fall below the poverty line, but we're going to have to give them $3 because we can't afford to give them that extra dollar. But we can continue to, uh, to prop up farmers uh, in perpetuity at the cost of $14 billion a year. Uh, again, I would call for an audit of the program. 12% of this district is living at or under the poverty line. We should be supporting them with food stamps, and we should be uh, making sure that where and when we give farm subsidies, they make good fiscal sense. Thank you. Mr. LaMalfa? My first opportunity to vote on a farm bill this session was one to eliminate the direct payment program in agriculture, and we've done that. We've moved instead where farmers have skin in the game by paying into an insurance program. There's some lot of wild accusations made about that, but that said, it's working out because when the price is above a certain standard, no payments go to anybody. When it falls below that, that's when the insurance kicks in. You know, you all pay for auto insurance, you only use it when something happens. Same thing with uh, the farm program under the insurance policy. The only benefits are when there is a problem with the market or a disaster. This is much more cost effective to do it this way because it's organized instead of ha things that happen during a disaster where it has to come directly out of the Treasury if the Congress agrees to do that. On the food stamp side, we don't want anything happen for those that really should be eligible. We just think that any program that has been in place for a lot of years needs to have uh, benchmarks and course corrections over its time. And so it was very modest what was done in that regard. Thank you. Mr. Elworth? The United States has a voluminous tax code. Um, I have reason to believe that nobody really understands it, including the IRS. What should we be doing, or what should the Congress and Senate be doing with our existing tax code? Mr. LaMalfa? Well, first of all, the IRS shouldn't be snooping in everybody's lives if they, were trying, if they don't understand their own tax code. They shouldn't be selecting winners and losers on who's going to be audited. So I think we need to do much reform to the IRS. That said, the tax code, the tens of thousands of pages as it is, doesn't work very well for the people. A flatter, fairer tax that is simpler for people to process and do themselves would be right. Anytime you try and touch it there, there's so, all these uh, interacting uh, issues of you try and adjust this tax code, it hurts that person. So it, it's, it's very, been very, very difficult to have that uh, discussion in Congress. My uh, colleague, Dave Camp, has been working very hard 
on uh, tax reform, and we have a long ways to go to do that. But I would like to see it be flatter, fairer, easier for all people to be able to understand and process their own taxes. Thank you. This is one of those issues that I believe, again, the moderate majority in Congress and in the United States agrees. The tax code is a mess, it's complicated, it's hard to follow, and it doesn't help any of us. It needs to be streamlined and simplified. In particular, small businesses are, have an onerous uh, amount of paperwork to do, and all of that can be made much more efficient. Uh, I just want to suggest that a flat tax is regressive. It would uh, fall harder on poorer people than it would on wealthier. And I'm a strong believer that people should be paying their fair share, and that includes the top 1% of this country. Thank you. What specifically will you do or implement to aid our veterans when they come home in regards to housing, jobs, health care, and benefits? And this question goes to Ms. Hall first. Thank you. Um, veterans issues are close to my heart, again, as a daughter and a mother of a veteran. Um, I, and I've seen the devastation that veterans have, have experienced here with uh, problems in our system. I've already uh, identified that I would dedicate one staff entirely to veterans issues in this district because we have such a high veteran population. I want to make sure there are incentives for businesses to hire veterans. That's something we can do right away that would be helpful to them. We can institute training programs to make sure they are coming back with the skills that can be used in our small businesses. Um, and I would not vote for the current budget sitting in Congress, the Ryan budget, which not only cuts senior services services and student loan issues, but it also cuts veterans. I would advocate for a budget that is fully funded for veterans issues. Thank you. Having been a federal legislator for almost two years now, that's, that issue has really hit home for us on how important it is. We've always uh, had a great love and value for our veterans. They're among our best in this nation. And to see how the VA system has been serving or not serving them, we've, we've put in many, many hours with several of my staff on that, trying to help individual veterans to get through to have, we've had claims that have been 36 years old that veterans have waited to get answers back from the VA to get their claims solved. Nobody should have to wait like that. It should be a very simple system where they say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, how do we help you get to where you need to be? So we've, had, we've helped initiate uh, a review of the Oakland VA office so that their poor track record of having tens of thousands of files sitting in a cart somewhere of unsolved, un, unworked claims for veterans who are waiting. And what does this cause veterans to be homeless, veterans to even give up and commit suicide? And this is for our best. It's really poor. We're working really hard. We'll continue to work with, on VA to get that done. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to make an announcement with standing room only. They have opened the con conference room, number one, down to the right. If you go out the hall and down to the right, they are broadcasting live there. There's a slight delay. So if any of you would like a seat, um, I would suggest you go out the door and down there and you'll still be able to see the forum. Here. Here the forum. <laughs> All right, this is our last question from the audience tonight. And the question is, do you agree with Citizens United decision from the Supreme Court and should Congress pass any legislation to address the decision? And the uh, question goes to Mr. LaMalfa to start. I think the court in its wisdom made the proper uh, ruling on that in that uh, everybody should have their First Amendment right to express themselves in elections in uh, the public square of who they support. So there needs to be uh, the type of accountability for who's donating to campaigns and we can work to refine that. McCain-Feingold is a nightmare for half the people trying to do it, including local groups that try and sift through unnecessary regulation on that. But that said, open accountability is a positive thing, but we shouldn't limit people's ability to be able to participate in the process of uh, who they want to support and elect, because to come down against that means it's going to be biased towards one type of group and against others. Thank you. I think most people agree that the Citizens United decision was a mistake. And what happens when we uh, say that 
speech costs money is that free speech is no longer free. I would support a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. I would support legislative action to overturn it. Money has corrupted our politics, and that goes to both the Democratic and the Republican parties and everyone in between. This country was based on one vote, one person. We need to be able to get our word out there equally, and the Citizens United decision was a corruption of many decisions that had come before it and should be overturned. Thank you. We will now do closing arguments. So Mr. LaMalfa will go first, and then Ms. Heidi Hall, you will each have two minutes to make your final closing statements. Thank well, you. Well, thank you again. I appreciate the, the League's effort here and everybody for showing up and being part of this. It's not easy in Washington, D.C. It's not easy because you have differing philo philosophies that collide in the House and they collide in the Senate. That is, if the Senate will take up our bills. But that said, it's been a real pleasure and an honor to be able to work on behalf of the people of the North State. My signs say water, jobs, liberty, and I think that pretty much encapsulates what the priority should be, at least in the short term, for water, getting the type of steps taken to help insulate us from the next drought. A dam doesn't stop a drought, but it helps insulate from the next one. We will get rainfall again someday, and if we have the systems in place, whether it's more storage, more desalination, we need to be self-sufficient on water in California in that sense. Jobs. The federal government is killing jobs with, for example, the waterways of the United States, the EPA and Army Corps of Engineers are shoving down people's throats. Our farmers here in the North State, you might even be with having a rain barrel on your house. You could be regulated from possibly capturing water that came off your own roof because of the overreach of government and regulations. That's killing jobs. It's an economy that's trying to recover and come back where people in this country need employment is being snuffed out by the federal government overreach in so many aspects of federal agencies. And that kind of plays right into the most important of those three, liberty. Our founders fought for the opportunities that we're enjoying. And if we don't embrace that, we're not going to have a country soon. Our liberty is what allows us to innovate, to be the leader in the world, to bring freedom and hope to the rest of the world. If that liberty is snuffed out, then we don't look like the United States anymore. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. I would appreciate your vote. God bless you. Thank you so much to the League for putting on this fantastic forum and for everyone for coming out tonight. This Congress has been the most dysfunctional Congress in the history of the United States, and that is why I am running. I am running to be an advocate for this region, an advocate in a way we haven't had one in a very long time, to provide leadership, to invest in education, in infrastructure, to get broadband up here to help our small businesses, to ensure that we protect our water and our forest resources, to protect our Social Security and our Medicaid, to create a North State that our children can and want to stay in, so they can have jobs, so they can get continue their education and stay here and raise their families. That's not what we have going on right now. We have had representation of less government is the best, and what I'm advocating for is a fiscally responsible, efficient government that's put its, its money in the right places to protect our, protect our people, and to protect our resources, and to get our money back onto Main Street, not keep recycling it through Wall Street, to get our economy growing. I would like to advocate and lead this North State, beautiful, incredibly beautiful, resource-rich North State to a place where we can be proud of it, that we are proud to protect our people and our resources, rather than asking to secede from the rest of the state. Thank you very much, and I ask for your vote on November 4th. Thank you. We will take a brief moment to uh, get ready to hear uh, candidate statements for the CUSD School District School Board.